<laughs> Welcome to the Lost Rewatch. Uh, we got three co-hosts with me tonight, and I, I was, I'm going to say it, two great episodes. I thought you were going to say two great hosts. Yeah. I know. I was like, <laughs> who is it? Which one? Well, I'd, okay, I'd, say, I'd say one great host if I had to say it, but uh, you know. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> of course. I appreciate that compliment. <laughs> No problem, Eckhart. Yes, I was talking. But no, I, uh, we were kind of chatting beforehand. Uh, so that's why we're a little, uh, what's the word for? A little uh, overly giddy happy giddy. already. <laughs> giddy. That's, that's actually the word I was looking for, giddy. Uh, but no, I, I thought two great episodes. And what did you guys think of? Well, we'll start with the life and death. You know, I keep calling, call, I, I wrote down the life and times of Jeremy Bentham. Yeah. I, I kept calling, I go, wait a minute, that's not it. It's the life and death of Jeremy Bentham. I got to say this. I'll say this right from the start. I thought this was one of Terry Quinn's, one of his strongest performances on the show. Without a doubt. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. I mean, you actually, you, he actually made you, you actually felt bad for John Locke. I, the whole episode is kind of feel bad for John Locke. You know, it's, it's really, um, one of his most pivotal episodes besides like those very early ones, I think, you know, in the whole series, obviously. And when I was watching it, I, I, I said, it was, you know, when he was trying to get, you know, first Saeed, then Hurley and, and then Jack, Kate and everybody else to go with him. I said, these people have already, they didn't follow him on the, the last person to follow him was Hurley. And Hurley only went because he had a gun. You know, he he made him go, right? The so these people were not going to follow him. There's no, he had no chance of getting these people to come back to the island. Yeah, I think a lot of what they um, said to him was true. I mean, whether he wanted to hear it or not. I mean, even even when he went to go see Kate, I mean, she had a valid point with what she said. You know, I'm not the biggest Locke fan, so I'm not gonna you know, jump on the bandwagon with, you know, everything he did is great. And uh, because a lot of his tragic backstory was mistakes he made as well. So um, especially when it comes to Helen. So, you know. But, I, but you, you brought up Kate. Go ahead. Yeah, Kurt. I mean, the thing that went through my mind was, again, the perspective that we have, of course, as we rewatch it is the whole thing. And also, we're all a little older. And I remember when I was watching this in real time, like up until the last moment, like you're kind of rooting for him. But when you watch it, like in the rewatch, I kept thinking about how this is the episode where the writers are basically telling the audience via all the people who are rejecting him. Something that Jack was, meaning Jack Glattfelter kept hammering home during the whole series which is that the guy Locke had this outside expectations of his life. Um, and at the same time, that made him very um, susceptible to people turning him into a mark. And right. that's what the entire episode, the tension of the entire episode is, is that, you know, Whitmore's, Whitmore's promising him this, you know, Linus is promising him something else. And they're just up until the last moment of his life. People are just kind of like playing him. Yeah, and and you can you hear both Widmore and um, Ben both say we're doing this so you can go back and be a leader, right? Right. So it's you know it's played upon played upon played because if you look at the whole thing, you know, um, uh, M I B or. Um, uh, Titus Wolliver and uh, Mark Pellegrino, sorry, their show names are escaping me right now, are playing Widmore and Ben, who are in turn playing Locke all right. the game, and they find this uber pawn, right? He's the super pawn, and, you know, the goal is to get him to die somehow so he can come back as a vessel. And, you know, he fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. They knew he wasn't going to get anybody back. He knew what they felt. And, you know, when Ben came in and said, you got Jack and you need to get Jack, that's all you needed to do. Um, I'm very confused about um, if Je if Ben, if uh, Locke did not say Eloise's Hawking's name at that moment, what what was the future going to be there? Well, even even before that, when 
when he talks about Jin and you see Ben's re react reaction, he says, Jin is alive. Like, and the, the right. Ben eyes go up. That was like, like to me, like that signaled that that was new information to right. Ethan. And that, like, uh, uh, sorry to Ben. And we, we really don't know <laughs> like what would have happened if Locke hadn't said that or Eloise Hawkins, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the trigger was definitely Eloise Hawkins because uh, Hawkins because you could see bit because because some people said no it was gonna it, he was gonna kill him no matter what I go well then why would he if ben, if Locke was gonna kill himself why did he talk him out of it in the first place? and have to go through all that work of setting up that mm -hmm. he killed himself and 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 does Ben not know that she's around somewhere in play on this big chessboard well I think he knows but yeah. he didn't know that Locke knew. Oh, and so when Locke, because Locke knows. Because Locke knows because of Widmore, right? Right. Uh, does uh, I think there's two issues at play here. The first one is Eloise, and Ben was like, oh, crap, he knows about Eloise somehow. Uh, he's not even supposed to know that. And that's, right. once again, that's a he's more special than me type of thing. Right. And then exactly. the second the second thing in place is that he mentions um, having Jen's wedding ring and that he wouldn't go see Sun. And Ben, that was the last puzzle piece for Ben that he didn't have access to, and finding out that Jen was still alive was enough information that Ben right. thought that that's all he needed, and he didn't need Locke for anything else. And then he had to drive the knife in with the whole, well, Eloise Hawking, and then that just pissed Ben right off, and was like, nope, I'm going to be the special one. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's why I... <laughs> By the way, something that went through my mind as they're setting up the scene for him to hang himself was, and again, part of this is because the last episode I did when we reviewed it was um, the Michael episode. Is oh, I, yeah. I kept expecting to see him not, Locke not being able to kill himself, right? Because the island wouldn't be done with him yet either, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thought that came to mind was that this whole notion of Ben killing um, Locke probably has some sort of underlying concept of, you know, toppling the leader, right? In order right. to take the power back. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I do want to mention um, to all the viewers, because uh, this is, you know, an episode that focus he focuses heavily on um, somebody dying by suicide or trying to commit suicide, things like that. And so if anybody out there is struggling, um, there's many websites available. Um, you can visit uh, NAMI.org as well as the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, which is AFSP.org. So I just want to throw that out there because I know we're going to be Thank talking you. about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is a pretty much. The, I did want to go back to where you, set, you started talking, Caleb, about Kate. And I think she had the best line in the whole – the whole episode when she, she was saying, well, Locke, you've never been in love. He goes, I, I have been in love. Her name was Helen. What happened? Well, I had some anger issues and it was obsessive a lot. And she goes, and she, Kate says, look how far you've come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I went, wow. Cause yeah, it's like straight boom, smacked him in the face with that one. Mm -hmm. Jack, did you get and a writing credit for that line? <laughs> <laughs> I should have no, but I did. I didn't get it. <laughs> And I don't think it was, you know, very like malicious. You know, I think it was honestly, that is the truth. I mean, yeah. she saw it for what it was. I mean, the last time she saw him on Island, he's throwing knives in people's backs, literally. Right. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, it's yeah. such a, it, it's such a good arc because, you know, we've talked about it a million times here and it's so worth mentioning again, he's the biggest surprise in the first season. He's so strong and powerful but then you see him just be a different person with every little setback that happens. You know, it, it first it's, um, he thinks he's special. And then like, as soon as he can't walk again, he crumbles. Um, right. And it just goes on and on to him having to push the button and then getting desperate about, cause he thinks, cause someone else told him, he thinks that they're there to kill him and, you know, him killing Naomi. You know what I mean? He, he's right. such, he's such a, I don't want to say bipolar personality. Maybe, maybe he is. I don't know. I mean, was was Jack's plea to him in the hospital or yelling at him in a pop 
hospital enough to push him over that edge. So much so that his only note for a suicide note is to, you know, make Jack feel bad. You know what I mean? It's another thing that's pressed by, you know, just um, not the person we saw in season one. Well, I, oh, I know we've talked about this a million times. Whatever Block saw in the smoke monster when he saw, so the island was beautiful. That changed his character from being provider, you know, the guy going out killing boars, all, all that to the guy that became obsessed with the island. His whole personality off the island, it came back. And it, 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 well, it made for a great character, but that's what changed him forever. But he saw things in the island that no one else saw. When they saw the smoke monster, they saw death and and scary things. And you know, they didn't see you know what whatever Locke saw. He saw something completely different. Because they treated him special. Because I mean, I guess the smoke monster picked his man. I think at that moment. Yeah, he he was the mark. He was the he was the pawn from that from that point on. Yeah. Poor Locke. Well, they, they knew that he was, like you said, uh, someone mentioned that he was very gullible. He just, uh, he wanted to believe he was someone special and people were using him. You know, his, his mom used him, his dad used him. I mean, it's a tragic, it's a tragic story. But I, I guess, like, how do we get, how do we connect the dots from, uh, you know, Jacob's playing his game, so is the man in black, and so is Widmore and Ben and Eloise. And Widmore makes the comment that if Locke doesn't go back to the island, the wrong side will win. And I'm just wondering whose side is he on? Whose side is Eloise on? Are they, do they have, like, do they know any of this? You know what I mean? Like, who's telling them that he has to go back? Well, it could have been part of the game where Jacob had set it up, right? Well, they all they all want to go back. Well, Widmore wants to go back to the island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They then obviously wants to go back to the island. They want the island. They want control of it. And maybe it goes back to you know they all said, well, if they get control of it, it will be bad for the island because you know, well, Ben said you know Ben said that famous line, we're the good guys, Michael. So really, why, you're the good guys. <laughs> why are Eloise and Ben working together to get them to come back? Like, what is their motivation there? It has to be something that's set up part of this game. I mean, part of the. Uh... I, I think on some level, everybody wants to know if it's going to work, no matter what side you're on. I think at some level, people have this lamppost and uh, they've been following this. And I don't know if they know for sure if it works, but they've. everyone has a vested interest to see this Ajira flight make it back to the island, I think, to see if it's even possible. Yeah. None, um, of, them, none of them have been able to get back there, right? Yeah, so. I think that's the big thing is that if just speaking strictly about Ben and and um, uh, Widmore, that because they've both left the island and can't get back, that they they view Locke as some sort of way to get there, right? Right. It's as simple um, as that, right? I think I realized, I think I answered my own question in my head. <laughs> um, I think Eloise... She obviously knows they go back. She knows. She already knows they go back. And so does Widmore because they saw them there. So right. I think, it, once again, Eloise is just trying to preserve the timeline. Now, does Ben know that they were there in the 70s and the Dharma Initiative, all that? I don't know. Um, I was thinking about that, too, after Widmore told Locke that he saw that Locke spoke to him when Widmore was young, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I as, feel, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. As far as my memory goes, I don't remember the, any, any of the flight, um, 316, um, of them encountering young Ben, right? As well, they're traveling. Well, not while they're traveling, but when they get there, like Saeed shoots him. Yeah, we'll find that out next week. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I think, I think, I think. No, I'm going to say something. I think, I think, I think. <laughs> no, but I was going to go back to the point. Like Ben doesn't know they were there in the 70s because when right. they take to heal him, they say, you're not going to remember any of this. Right. So I think Ben is completely ignorant of um, any of the 815 crew going back to the island in the 70s.
unless he's been told by Eloise because she's trying to she's the she's the in charge of the timeline and making sure it's secure and everything goes the way it's supposed to go. Hey, hey, man. Man, trust, but nobody trusts Ben. That's John Locke trusts him. Well, Ben Jack trusts him. John Locke trusts anything and everything for no reason. <laughs> Just gotta pay John a compliment, and he's he's yours. Um, what? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the greatest, John. Okay, what do you want? Um, well, I, was, I was thinking about just like th what they accomplished in this one episode was just such a, f just within 40 to 50 minutes, just a complete slide, right? And to the point where one of the last things that happens before John actually decides to commit suicide is he looks at the Widmore phone, right? Right. And Widmore said, basically said, this is my direct line. If you, you need anything, call me. The guy obviously has a bunch of resources. John could have called him up and been like, look, I'm not having any luck with these people. What should I do or what, what else can we try? And he doesn't even use that. Like, well, was Abaddon, there, was Abaddon there to make him feel bad? Because he really hammered home. Oh, that's that's two. You, didn't, <laughs> you couldn't get – that's three. I don't know. I mean, I don't heard it, 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 it doesn't seem like Abaddon was working with him. He, uh, yeah, and he even made the comment about like he he uh, I help people get to where they need to be. When he said, um, when Hurley said he he doesn't know if he's real or not, and then Abaddon, um, Locke remembers that Abaddon was like being creepy and visiting in the hospital when he first right. uh, was pushed out the window, and then Abaddon says. I, I help people get to where they need to be. And I'm just like, that. that's a little Eloise-y. It reminds me of trying to like, you know, make sure the timeline works. It's, you know, and if he's part of Widmore's people or helping Locke on behalf of Widmore, we know the tie Widmore has with Eloise. Surely he knows about her and may be helping her in the process. Because, um, I mean, it's obvious who... Kills but, but, Locke, but Locke has to. But Locke has to die, right? Both Widmore. Everybody wants Locke to die. Yeah, but I also think that they don't want to get their hands dirty with getting people back to the island, so they're going to see if he can even try to first. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is is with Abaddon? Abaddon gets people to where they're supposed to be. Yeah, Locke is supposed to be dead. Yeah. So, so, so is he helping Locke, pushing him in that direction because he kept. He, he, you know, because Locke said, I thought you were just my driver. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, yeah. Because he, he was getting under Locke's skin. I mean, he, he knew it was almost like Ben in a way. He knew how to twist and make Ben uh, Locke feel like crap. So it's like the way I interpreted that line about I help people get to where they're supposed to go or whatever it is, is that's it's almost like a set pattern that we see now. I'm not sure if it's from Q's or Lindelof. I'm going to assume it's Lindelof, where you take a secondary character and you you create some ambiguity in what they say so that you don't really know, first of all, so that we're debating it here, but also it's, it's, it's so ambiguous that you're not sure if there's some sort of like harmful intention or if it's just something that's trying to sound helpful, right? Right. It's just... Well, and it's I'm something sure, we talk about 15 years later. Yeah, I'm sure when he <laughs> said that, that the music that they used for the background was like a minor key as well. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make it sound a bit ominous, right? <laughs> but I never really thought about it before until I watched this episode. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm like going, yeah, Abaddon is not working with him. He's like, anything you need, Mr. Locke, anything you need. Well, he's not, and I and I'm gonna say it right now. I don't think Helen was dead. I think that was just something they could use to push him over the top. I I think that was the plan was to make Locke just want to end it all. I can see that. That thought maybe did cross my mind, but um, I guess I'm gonna choose to believe that she was dead because. There was it, it seemed like such an important conversation there with because Locke was like, you know, I um you know, 
he's I wrote all this down. He said that uh, he kind of pushed back with Abaddon a little bit, um, wondering if things would be different if he had stayed with Helen, because Abaddon was like, "Oh, it would always end the same," and Locke was like, "No, it wouldn't have." And I was like, "So here we go with the predetermined." You know, is are is things predetermined? Blah blah blah. Um, but I think Locke's biggest mistake was worrying too much about his dad. He kept on choosing somebody who continued to show him no love, and he kept on doing that. And Helen was right there the whole time in his face, and he took her for granted, and. Um, that's why as tragic as his backstory is part of it is like hey you knew how your dad was you could have said no you know after that first i'm gonna steal your kidney thing like <laughs> that, that should have been enough <laughs> like that was way over the line you should have had no you know and i understand it's hard to let go and the whole that's what the whole show's about and blah 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 but um that's really where i think he went wrong well, that's why I say, because he, you know, why ask for Helen? You know, he, he, he mm -hmm. if Helen was there, and maybe he goes, you know what? Maybe I don't go, maybe I make a second chance at it. Maybe I make a, I, I think Helen had to be out of the picture. But I also think, I, I think Helen was working with uh, Anthony Cooper the whole time. I still believe that. That she was, that she was a plant from Anthony Cooper to keep track of John Locke, because she just, if you're truly in love with someone, her reason for leaving was kind of eh, a couple times. Why wouldn't he be obsessed with his dad? Why would he, the guy just wants to be loved by his by his parents? And his parents were complete a holes. I mean, his, Back, his dad is sure, the worst. Are you sure you're not confusing this character with uh, Gemma from Sons of Anarchy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, I was no, Gemma just would have killed John. But uh, <laughs> I'm confusing her with Nilo from Futurama. <laughs> No, I just, I just believe that that she, that that she didn't because, like she, oh, that's it. I'm out, John. Yeah. No, um, I'm not. No, I'm I don't. Out, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I don't think she was working with Anthony Cooper. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was correct the theory. You need to let go. And um, <laughs> and um, I don't. I you know I I want to believe she was dead, but l let's think about it. How good was that going to go? The the first time we ever met Helen. He was. It was someone that he was paying to call Helen on the phone, right? right? So I mean, no, Helen, no, it wasn't her on the phone. No, no. was it Hel It was a pay. It was, it was, was all that. So he was already in the wheelchair at that point. Yeah, the first time we hear the name Helen, he's yeah, talking to her on the yeah. phone. And it's like a pay for, pay for talking. But the that's meeting. not. That's not Helen. No, we know that. No. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, but but that's the first time we hear the name Helen. Yeah, and John. He and that's before he not before not, the, he not the not the not the Helen he's supposedly the Helen he loved. Okay, he working for uh, Anthony Cooper. The it was uh, it was pay Helen. It was one, of those phone, one of those phone sex workers. Yeah, yeah, right. But I don't think her name was even Helen. I think no, he was no, just calling he, he, her he Helen. He called her Helen. He called her Helen. Right. Yeah. Because he was he was paying her, so she would answer to anything. Right. right. Talk to him. So I'm I'm just saying I don't think it would have gone well even if he did talk to her, even if she was alive and and he did talk to her. I, I don't think. Oh no. no. Yeah. No, I think she was completely done, as would I have been. With yeah. Him, as his continual. Um, well, she was done because Anthony Cooper was dead and was no longer paying her. Listen, let's talk about you know, let's get real here for a second. Guys. No. Oh my God. So I'm taking a lot of my personal life into this aspect. Um, because I mean, it's really no secret, but, uh, uh, my husband and I have had to take legal action against his, um, parents because of death threats and stalking and everything. They just, you know, went crazy. Um, but I mean, I've been in that position of your spouse trying to get, trying to maintain a relationship with, you know, his, his parents and his family. And they continually screw you over, over and over. And for, you know, three, four years, trying desperately to get them to understand and them doing another one mean thing after the other. And me saying, you know, still try, still try. They'll come around, things like that. So 
uh, especially after rewatching and, you know, the first time I saw it, uh, I didn't really have this much of a personal stake, you know, in this, but now I'm like, absolutely. Uh, she should have left Locke screwed up. He should have let it go. He did not. Helen was there for him throughout the whole thing. I mean, she even, didn't she slap him and was like, we, we put this behind us. And then, you know, she, one episode, she threw the keys over the fence and was like, you need his, and, and that's, that's exactly what it is, is he needed Anthony Cooper's love more than hers. And she was completely right about that. And in my life, it was more of like, they hated me more than they loved their own son. So I completely, completely understand why Helen left. Oh, sure. Yeah. So you should have left. Had right, to throw me, that out there. That's why I'm so I, like, there's no way she's working with it. Uh, you almost sold me. Let me, let me make my case again. Oh yeah. I okay. want to hear it. Absolutely. Okay. okay. John is obsessed with his dad, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's going, he's going to him all the time. So how would Anthony Cooper get locked out of his life? The window? Hi, well, that too, but hire someone to get John's attention and to drag. You need to forget about your dad. You need to forget about your dad. Come on. You're not saying Anthony Cooper would not have that in him? Well, I think Anthony Cooper probably felt what he was doing was enough. Yeah, but you don't want someone. But he, he's a con man. He's so he's probably trying to get Locke. I need to get this know, guy you know, out of my life. You, ever, you know why? Because he did go back and track down Swoozy Kurtz, right? To get that start, that ball rolling. I don't know. The same. Maybe, maybe Jack. Anyway. Right. But he wanted a kidney, right? So that was the that was the first big thing. His dad wanted a kidney. He wanted and, a kidney, not a relationship, and and Locke wouldn't let it go. Right, but then. What happened was Locke, you know, was stalking the his house and, yeah. you know, the security guard was like, you know, no. And so he went to the support group because it was still eating him up, which is where he met Helen and or whatever. So and, and Helen's into bald guys. <sighs> Balding guy. Well, <laughs> he was in various states at that turn and he would, yeah. she'd be in the me right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um so like what what was the next the next thing is the hotel with the money why why um i'm losing the circumstances surrounding that he had uh, a jaw or oh oh he faked his death right right, right right and helen was the one who saw it in the newspaper and was like your father died which I mean, because I Helen said the same thing. Helen, who's into bald guys, also the first thing she reads in the morning paper is the obituaries, which is which is effing creepy, I have to say. I, I mean, of all the things you, I mean, I'm not saying you can't read the obituaries, but that's but the first thing get, you read. Don't get stoked for the obituaries. But she did say that. Uh, what did she say? Nobody ever says anything nice about you until you're dead, or something along the lines of that. Um, so she's and probably, get, she, knowing her, she's probably like, what's this bullshit they said about this dead person? I probably knew them in real life and if they weren't a good person or and something And if you like truly that. love someone and you know they're obsessed with someone, why even bring it up? Because she thought that this was another chance for him to finally let it go, especially if she, after all they had been through, she thought that he would still be obsessed with it. And... You know, it's just, it's just so heartbreaking because he was planning on, you know, proposing to her and everything. And and I guess he finds out that, uh, you know, Anthony Cooper was had faked his death and was trying to, like, give Locke a bunch of money. And it's like, Locke, no, like no money. There's no money in the world. Like, there, it's not worth it. You had Helen right there with you, you know, like leave him alone. He doesn't want you. It's been proven time and time again. So that's how Diane I feel said, about it. <laughs> Diane said, don't you think Helen should have maybe been tipped off that Locke might not be completely over his issues since they met in an anger management class that Locke didn't continue to attend? Yeah, I think that's why she was helping him or tried her best to. 
And then until she realized he's not going to let this go, he's going to call, he, you know, he does all this. He's going to offer him money and he took his kidney. It doesn't matter what he is. Locke's going to go run into him if he, even, you know, no matter what it is. So I think Helen just gave up. Most people would have at that point. Okay, we're we're on a, we're on a stalemate on this one. We we can't go any further. <laughs> so I mean, what do y'all think? <laughs> that she was working. No one, with, no one can uh, hear your answer. No one can hear that answer, Ethan. They can't. It's if they're not watching, they can't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I do not. I do not think that she was working with um, Kevin Tyke. What's his name? Kevin Ty. Kevin Ty, yeah. Anthony Cooper. Anthony Cooper. Tony, I don't think she was working. I've, I've, uh, what do you say? I've used many names over the past. Sawyer, <laughs> you could, you could say Sawyer. You're on some kind of revenge kick. Sorry, <laughs> I did do it. <laughs> he was nice on Emergency, but since then he's just played a string of just bad guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean they damn. really cast that guy really well. Yeah, he's he's just a bad. He was like the nicest, the nicest guy in emergency. If you've ever seen it, it's it's a show from the seventies. But he, ever since then, every character he has is usually he's a jerk. Uh, he was in Salem. Let's get down to serious business. Caesar, why is he here? Can he die soon? Well, I think he does. Does not disagree? Yeah. yeah, disagree. You like Caesar? You know what I thought about is, I mean, Caesar. I've seen him in some other stuff. He but had a moment around that time. The, the Three Kings. Yeah. I, with, uh, I, you know, I was Wahlberg, thinking about uh, Go ahead, Clooney Edgar. and uh, it Ice Cube. Yeah. Mark Wahlberg and Spike Jones. All right. Clooney. So Spike Jones. Ice Cube. Yeah, sorry. Oh, so okay. Caesars, you know, <laughs> I couldn't help but think about Frenchie from The Boys. <laughs> the Amazon okay. series. And I, I, when they first introduced Caesar, I was hoping it would be a character like that who'd be around for more than like one or two episodes. Um, and of course, my favorite memory from watching it the first time that episode was where you see him reach underneath the desk and grab the sh sawed off shotgun mm -hmm. and then quickly hide it. And I was like, this guy's shifty. I like him. Mm -hmm. Well, then he lies to Alana. Alana goes, what exactly. you, what did you put? I saw you put something in your back. Oh, the flashlight. Do you want it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, but we know now, but we didn't know then. Alan is a uh, an agent of Jacob, yeah, right, like purely, right? Yeah, Gal, yeah, Caesar was annoying. Thank you. Uh, what did we think about um, <laughs> Said telling Locke that he wants to go back to the island so badly because he has nowhere else to go? Kind of like what Kate said to him: "You've never been in you. love. You don't know." Mm -hmm. I think everybody is right in what they're saying to Locke. I think everyone is right, except um, Jack is the one that seems out of sorts with it. He's already, you can tell, oh, he's already beginning to spiral. Yeah, yeah. He's already, and I think Locke coming there was just another, like, this, you know, coincidence, fate, he winds up at the same hospital, whatever. I think that was just another one of Jack well, being like, God, this won't stop. <laughs> what, what tipped Jack over, I, t t t I mean, was the part where Locke says, your dad says hello. Mm -hmm. What? What? You know, yeah. Jack goes, well. And why wouldn't John be smart enough to let that simmer a little bit with him? Well, you just said, why Locke's wouldn't John be smart enough? Yeah, that, no. that's the problem. He, um, Locke's, not, Locke's not good at that. Yeah. Locke's, he's, he's just not good at the long game. And is this the last? Is this the last episode where we see any of John Locke at all? Until, pardon the expression, the choich. Yeah, yeah. This is it? All right. Um, it was, you know, it was not nice. sideways, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it was. It was nice to see um, Walt again. Yeah, but I, but there was a line there that kind of threw me off. Um, he first of all, Locke lied about Michael. He knows he's dead. He didn't say. Well, do, um, do you, you want to be that guy? I don't. I, it's like, you want to be the guy that like lies to him, pretending 
The, uh, I I don't know. <laughs> if, if I'm John Locke, I've had enough. I've had enough bad things happen in my life. I well, to... and that goes exactly to my point because he said Abaddon was like, "Why are you not telling him? Why are you not taking him with you?" And Locke was like, "Well, Walt's been through enough." And I was like, "But haven't they all?" <laughs> I mean, well, no but, wonder but, Kate and everybody else is like, "We're not going back." You know, <clears throat> they've all been through a lot, but uh, Walt still has his whole life ahead of him. Right, and he always and he has to live with the fact that his dad killed people to get him off the island. We all have troubles. I guess with the whole um, what's it called epilogue or whatever with Walt and Hurley and Ben going to yeah. get him. I guess it made less sense that comment. Uh, oh, he's been through enough. Oh, well, later he's going to end up right, right back on the island. So, but they still were. Enough. They were still setting my, uh, Michael. They were still setting Walt up to be special because yeah, I've been having dreams about you. Yeah, I'm wearing a suit and surrounded by people. Yeah, so they're still they're still with the Walt is special. Mm -hmm. But he's not having dreams about Locke. Is he? Is he having dreams about? He thought it was, but he thought it was Locke. Talking about in, yeah, Titan Silver. Yeah, That's what's going on? Mm -hmm. Oh, you probably watched Deadwood. Um. But what about Locke? Uh, I, I guess Locke doesn't know that term. Uh, don't leave no man behind. Because Abaddon gets shot, and what's the first thing he does? Jumps in. And he wasn't thinking about where he's going at all. No. And he knew Jack was on his list anyway, right? Right. So, uh, you know. Have you Jack, Jack, Jack's just sitting there judging him like a. Jack is so judgy and he's so mean um, and he's so leaning in and he's just, you're a crazy guy that crashed on an Island. Well, look, who's, you know, look at, you know, look at you, you know, and you know, he books that ticket right after is that first flight we see him taken. In, in now did he story. book, but, but did he book it because uh, Locke said, I, your dad says hi. I think it's one of the reasons I think Jack's got a lot of things inside. I think Jack yeah. building up, you know, he, has, he had no closure with his dad. None. No. I think Jack ultimately later when he decides to go back to the island, obviously Locke's fake suicide um, was a catalyst for that. But I think that, you know, Locke kept on saying all Jack knew of Locke was how erratic and crazy his behavior was killing people left and right blowing up submarines you can't leave the island so it was almost like jack's like i'm going to leave the island whether you like it or not and it was right. totally not Locke's place to put these rules in place to decide no. who gets to stay in or leave so lock was completely wrong in that aspect but i think with the whole things are special and special and you don't know how special it is and the island special. And I think uh, just over time that being, you know, beat into Jack made him think. And then, you know, the comment about his dad and the little weird things Jack experienced on the island himself. I think he was try finally starting to be like, you know, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't have left. Maybe I should have stayed. But I don't think he was wanting to go back to the island and for the same reason Locke thought the island was so grand and wonderful. I think Jack was like, there's some, you know, I'm missing something and I want to figure it out. I think that was more the way he went, which would be kind of science based. And Locks was like, oh, on faith alone, the whole island's great. Doesn't matter if I'm killing people or not, <laughs> but it's great. <laughs> uh, uh, raise a hand. Who's read The Dark Knight Returns? Anyone? Anyone? No? Okay. So in The Dark Knight Returns, Bruce Wayne has his pool to be Batman, but he doesn't want to be Batman again, but he finds himself doing things that Batman would do, even though he doesn't want to do it consciously. Like, so one day he's in the shower and all of a sudden his mustache is gone, right? He doesn't remember shaving it. He just feels this thing that says you have to shave your mustache because if you're going to put on your batty wings, you can't have, a, you can't have facial hair. So Jack's kind of doing the same thing. He doesn't know why, but all of a sudden he's on a plane to Tokyo. You know what I mean? He doesn't know why, but he's going back and forth, catching rides because you know he feels he feels something, and I think that's what's going on with Jack. With Jack too, does do you think he feels? Because Locke does say, 
we, you need to come back to save the people on that we left behind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that I just thought about that when you said that. I said, well, Jack, that's Jack's biggest thing is he he felt he had to protect all those people. Well, could that have been it? He said, you know, OK, these people, I don't want these people to die. And, I, you know, and I'm living my life when I said I would protect these people. Yeah, I think could that's that, a could, big, that, could, that, could that have been the uh, trigger. Yeah, I think that's a big yeah, part I, of it. I was thinking about that too during that scene with with Locke and um, Jack. That first of all, how both of them are so like they've shriveled from where they right. were on the island, right? Cold water. And both of them had fallen so far. But you know when he, when he, when he talked about his dad. You know, it must have also reminded Jack that his sister, right? Oh yeah, true. Was still on the island because at that point, and he that that he that. must have that right. Um, yeah, that immense amount of remorse. I think at the beginning, and that's probably one of the. Th- at the back. beginning, it was like, well, the island disappeared. Everybody's dead, I guess. So I guess I'm just going to go live my life with Kate and blah blah. And then suddenly Locke shows up, who you think was left back on the island, and you're like, "How?" Jack's probably like, how are other people getting off the island? You know? I mean, we went through a whole press junket when we got back to Oceanic 6, and Locke just shows up, and, you know, that's probably part of his, like, what is going on, you know? Oh, yeah, uh, and, and and Hurley just thought he was a dead person. Right. He thought it was like Charlie's ghost coming to visit him. Yeah, he thought he was like the only thing that creeped him out more than he wasn't creeped out at all about dead John Locke coming to say hi. But when he found out he was real, he, you know. Yeah. He, and the writer set that up a season earlier. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because he mentioned I, he, sees, I, he sees Echo, he sees obviously Charlie. Mm-hmm. This is my favorite season of Lost. I want to say that. Oh, mine too. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's hard to, I mean, I'll still go to season one just because it started it all, but it's hard to argue this not being a great season. Um, did you guys, did you, I know Eckhart did, did you read that, uh, see that Collider interview with Damon Lindelof? That's only like a couple months old. It's fantastic. I mean, it really puts the whole thing in perspective in terms of like the tension that they dealt with on a ongoing basis, but then their decision to map things out. And then to fill the fill in the the gaps is fantastic. Well, th- th- like I said, you can tell like they had from season four on they had a plan. I mean, I think they had a plan the whole time, but I think they did have filler episodes because they did have to, you know, you know, first they had to have what twenty two, twenty three episodes a season, and that that's just hard. I mean, it's just that's a difficult thing when you're trying to tell a story. I think. What the what the interview you were did it was really interesting because he said you know he asked him about people always ask him about the first season of Lost or the last season of Lost and this guy asked him about tell me about the second season of Lost and where you guys were after you know the Emmys because you know it's like the day after the Emmys you know they were in the writers room and you know it's just really really interesting and it shows exactly how much they had planned. And exactly how much season five was written because they knew what they wanted to do in season six, right? Um, to set up the time. And of course, uh, Ethan, the part that I really honed in on was when Lindelof was talking about how his experience as a child watching Twin Peaks, and how they botched the the season two, and yeah. that actually ended up being like a life lesson for him in terms of how to make sure that like they tie this off properly. And you notice uh, they were talking about mostly they were talking about Lost and Watchmen, but the hat he was wearing, leftovers, baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I did. Ha- I did have a question for all of you. Did Locke have to die off the island? Could he have died on the island, and it would have? Did he? He had to die off the island. Yeah, because yeah. the island wouldn't let him die, right? On the island. Yeah. yeah. Everything I think that they had, Man in Black had. Not man. Yeah, Man in Black had planned. It went exactly as it was supposed to for him to wind up on the island. That's what I think. Because if the Man in Black could have used any dead person on the island, he could have used Shannon or whatever to get what he wanted or anybody who had already died. But the island wasn't going to let John die on the island. 
because there's there's a couple there's at least two or three times he should have died, right? But he all that was explained, you know, scientifically, kind yeah. of. But another thing I had I wanted to ask too when when John first he lands in Tunisia and he's laying there and he can't move because he has a broken leg and he throws up. He's there for hours. Did Woodmore make him wait there for hours? That's Jesus another. Me. I noticed that this time. He didn't because, do. Hmm. He didn't do anything to try to get out of that situation. He just laid there, even though I know he was stuck and he couldn't move, but he just laid there motionless. Yeah. He basically laid down to die unless someone came and got him. He didn't move from that spot for all those hours. But from a from a from a psychological, you know, from a psychological angle, it was Whitmore just making him suffer a little more to say, "Yeah, I saved you. Look how I saved your life." Just to kind of get, you know, lock because on when, his side. when Ben went through, they picked him up immediately or tried to. Right. Yeah. That's a really good point, and you saying that has really got me thinking about Helen being dead or not. Because if you look at this in a purely Widmore is trying to psychologically bring him down, tear him down to the point of dying to get his body back to the island for whatever reasons they think should be, then that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense to leave him out there, to have Abaddon say the things he's saying, to be like, yeah. oh yeah, Helen's dead. Here's a grave. She died from yeah. this. Yeah. Um, that does not, you know, it may, you can look at it that way for sure. I mean, Widmore did stage a fake plane crash. Mm -hmm. That's quite something. Yeah. So it, how hard would it be to get a fake tombstone? And uh, um, yeah. question, question for clarification at this point in time, do we know that Widmore knows, um, almost like the pattern that they need to attempt? To, to, like what, to get back to get back to um, I think he I yeah. think he probably knows. Okay. I'm sure I mean you can always argue that he has so many resources that had just try everything. Well I'm sure that's what he was doing, but I think he yeah. I think that's what he was doing. I that's where I get so confused is I'm like, where is I know Ben I know Ben is wanting to like get back and be the leader because he wants complete control. That's obvious. But Eloise is more like, okay, Ben, go and get him and bring him to me. And when he comes and he's like, oh, I've only got a few people. And she's like, well, you better get them all. Um, she already knows who's going to be there or not. She already knows. She, she lived it. She knows who's going to be there. So for her to, to just tell Ben to go out and get him is like she already knows that's going to happen. But the question is Widmore. Is he following along with Eloise? Is he trying to just have his own agenda on the side, but still push these people to go back because he lived it too. And he knows that they're going to go back. But you also have Woodmore wants to save his daughter. So he needs to get rid of Ben. Right. So, because it, before Ben gets on the plane, he's all beaten up and bloodied. By so. Desmond. By Desmond. So was Desmond Tip? What did Desmond? I mean, what was go what? I mean, I'm sure Widmore had, you know, eyes on Penny the whole time too. I don't know because Widmore was like, I've not seen my daughter in however long. I think it was the Jughead episode. He was like, yeah. I've not. I yeah. mean, a lot of these characters were like, <laughs> Yeah, they said that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. I haven't seen my daughter in three years. Well, he might not have been seen her in person, but he's, I'm sure he, he has enough money. If, if you want to, if you have that kind of money, you can see anybody you want. You don't, maybe not in person, but you have detectives and people following around, taking pictures and keep an eye. Or maybe they wanted, maybe Eloise was working with Ben because uh, Widmore wanted him to get back to the island so he wouldn't kill Penny. Maybe that was his motivation to get. Been back there, but then he sent, you know, maybe he sent some people over there. Maybe Caesar, I don't remember. Someone to kill Ben. Or maybe that was what it was. Who knows? I mean, there's so many twists and turns you can take this this story going on that I think Eloise doesn't care um about Widmore or Ben for that matter. I think she 
is uh, like I've said, I think she's one of the most tragic characters in the whole show um, because of what she went through and what she's basically forced to do um, to keep the timeline to stay the same. And I think that she has her own agenda, which is get everybody to come back, Ben. Come on. And she knows they're going to, whichever ones are supposed to be there, will be there. And they're not going to Guam. <sighs> so overall, no. what did you guys think of this episode? Strong. What? I think they work better. Oh. Oh, girls. But that's me. I like this episode. It was a good one. All right, we're all in agreement. Yep. All right, now let's talk about LaFleur. All right, I got to go. I'll see you guys later. Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, literally, I, I think I literally requested this episode like two yeah. years ago. I was like, if you're doing the Wall Street recap, I want to do LaFleur. Uh, I, I, I wrote it down. That's why. Yeah. And then I remind you again in the season five. I was like, here I am. Yes, I've been waiting, counting the days. Now, I, I go back to when uh, I was spoiled that it was Sawyer. But I know leading mm. up to it, I, I, I go Lafleur because I would look at the titles ahead of time. I go, mm -hmm. who the hell is Lafleur? And then like yeah, a week, I remember you talking about that on the yeah, podcast. Someone sent, an, someone sent an email or something, maybe MySpace. I don't know what it was at the time, but I go, oh, why would you tell me that? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I always thought that it was a play. Jacko like this on Lafleur's because from from Butch Cassidy <laughs> yeah. and from. Yeah. And from they took that off on Mallrats, which is where I first heard of LaFours, because you know, I always thought that there was something to that. Um, it's been dashed over the years, but I always thought that there was something to a random name of someone you don't know. It's La Fours or something like that. It probably was, but I, I do like the start because you got Phil and uh, what's the other guy's name? Phil and Jerry, and we don't like at this point we don't hate Phil. Oh, you. God. I think in the at the, when you were watching this, you already like had a bad vibe with him. Oh, for the I? first time, I think it's for the first ah, moment Patrick ah, Fischel Patrick Fischel shows up. You like had a real bad vibe, and it's terrible because I've seen yeah. the actor, and he's actually in several Lynch productions, right? And I keep thinking about Jack just like joning on him left and right every time he shows up on screen. <laughs> I, I, watched, know, yeah, I tried to listen to the podcast to be along with Eckhart this time. I listened to, and I realized there's four four hours of podcast a week you guys were doing for Lost. Really? I, listened, I listened to the first hour of each episode, so I didn't hear the moratorium after that, but I did hear some of uh, Phil's stuff from Jack, for sure. Well, I, I do like how they, they're just terrified of Sawyer. Yeah. They they don't want it. They, it's like, well, you want to wake him up? I don't want to wake him up. You wake him up. Because uh, was it someone? Who, what was the name of the girl that made the brownies? I didn't write her name down. She made Stella. Great, or something. Is it Stella? It might have been Stella. She made great brownies. And we know what kind of brownies those were. But yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it's always fun when someone uses the word hoot nanny. So hoot nanny. Yeah, yeah that's I like what I was gonna say. We after that, um, a lot of us uh, used scop, and it was called hoot nanny. And a lot of the lawsies, um, we would like get on there. And like, um, you know, talk about the show and stuff. Like, I think Joe was in there, uh, Alice, um, Bonnie, um, a lot of people were um, in it. And we, it was like a hoot nanny from there on out. It was like <laughs> just I, always used. We also get the line Coconut Express, right? Yeah. Or Coconut. Uh, coconut Telegraph. Tele coconut Telegraph. Yeah. yeah. Coconut yeah. Telegraph. I said, I said, well, that's that's that line. It was because he, Horace is like going, we'll just keep it a secret. <laughs> yeah, this Horace has been drinking and he's and he's got dynamite because we find out at the end he found the little cross that it was Paul's and she had, she, Amy had kept it. So of course you're going to go get drunk and throw dynamite at trees. Well, it's an onk. Let's, let's an onk. Yeah, I'm sorry, an onk. It's an onk. Yeah, uh -huh. the thing I saw that you saw in Logan's Run. Yes, Logan's Run. And the big thing that's in Hurley's um, guitar case, right, is an onk. Yeah, I always when I see it, I automatically think of Logan's Run. Yeah, 
and the statue is um, holding one in each hand, right. which, by the way, this is the first time we see the statue fully built. You see it kind of. Are there two from, statues? Uh, what? Are there two statues? No. no. So when I was trying to get this background, there was definitely two different like angles of statue. One with like its legs kind of open, and one like not. I well, we all know about the foot, right? How it was right. like when they originally saw it in season two, it was like the left one. And then right. later on, it was the right one or whatever. Inconsistent. Whatever. Inconsistent. I almost stopped watching the show at that point. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, but he's, who's, who's Sawyer's sidekick, which cracks me up? Miles. It's Miles. Because when you yeah. see them, they, they just don't get along. You know why? Because they're so similar. They're both smart asses, so they they don't um, uh, they don't they just don't get along. And I I just when you see them together, it's like, huh, that's nice. Yeah. I, I like them together. Because when we when we see them, you know, before this, they're in time traveling in the jungle, and uh, Juliet and Miles and all them, and Miles like, well, what are we gonna do? And Sawyer's like, we're going back to the beach, and. He, Miles is like, well, that's stupid or something. And Juliet's like, well, don't come then. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they're always butting heads. And now here they are, like, um, buddy, buddy. Well, because it, it, uh, Sawyer says, hey, thanks for having my back. And she goes, well, it's a stupid plan, but I couldn't listen to you guys argue anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Miles yeah. was right, though. He goes, oh, this is your plan. We're going to go to the beach and go to the orchid, then go to the beach. You guys have, like, two plans. Yeah. Again. Yeah. That was again. You should have gotten a writing credit for that, Jack, because yeah. whoever whoever wrote that line for Miles obviously was listening to the podcast. Because that's basically <laughs> something you would say by season three or season four. Like these people just keep running back and forth. Yeah, make up your mind, have a plan. But anyway, <laughs> but I like how Amy goes into labor, and and Juliet is Juliet a doctor? No, she's a mechanic. Mm -hmm. that's that's her jar, job in the dharma initiative but i like how we, we keep going back because we see how uh sawyer and juliet rescue amy from the hostiles sawyer thinks his gun went off and he shot the other and then yeah, the, and he's camera, like the camera pans to juliet no she's the badass she's the one who saved him <laughs> yeah, she she's the better shot yes much better shot but i like it because that, that, at this point we we, we also see that sawyer is being, you know, uh, they got um, Amy fooled them with the uh, pylons. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were supposed to be on the sub the next day. So where I remember watching, okay, well, how did they end up in the Dharma Initiative? So the whole thing plays out. Um, I thought they did a great job with that. That was pretty good. Well, I, I mean, I was going to save my rant till the end of the episode, but now I'm not. So um, <laughs> why I wanted to do this episode, I forgot why. And so you, just, you just wanted to do it, so complain? Yeah, no, no, no. I have nothing to complain about. They take, <laughs> they take Sawyer and Juliet and tell you everything that happened in those three years in 45 minutes. You don't have any questions about anything. Yeah, you're right. You buy them. You, you get them as a couple. You think they match perfectly. By the end of this, you're like, Kate, who? Um, yeah. <laughs> really? Um, kind of like he is until he sees her again. I just... I love this. I love this episode because of how they totally change. You know, it's pre Lafleur Sawyer and post Lafleur Sawyer, right? Like this is the change for him. He from now on, he's a sympathetic, cool guy. I mean, he has been for a while, right? right? He's been he's been he's been involving since like middle of season four. But this just takes it. Do you know how many people don't trust him to do the right thing? You know, Miles says um, he's probably telling them about time travel. Juliet says, you know, be careful. And he's got it all covered. He's got, he's cool as a cucumber. He goes out there and he talks to Richard and he tells him the truth straight up. Um, and you can see how this evolves from two weeks to staying there, the three weeks. It, it, it completely tells this whole story. So by the time the 815 people or the 316 people are back, you don't have any questions about the last three years, what's happened on that island. Yeah, I never looked at it that way, but you're right, 100. And um, I, you know, I just love all this time travel in this season. I love Juliet and Sawyer. I love them together, especially. 
And, you know, this episode kind of sets up things that we see in the incident. And it, it's all building towards that scene at the machine in, in the end that, you know, that's the one that turns me into a blubbering little child. And uh, that's I my, add, my add that <laughs> since, since we watched this right after back to back with the other episode, the thing that struck me immensely was just like how much, how much more competent Sawyer appears in this episode compared to either, um, uh, Locke or Jack, or Jack in the prior episode, right? In terms of the contrast between what Ethan just said, the way that he handles the whole Richard situation, and the way that both Locke and Jack sound in that hospital scene. Like, right. Jack obviously, like, already falling apart, and Locke having already given up. Well, and, on the island, Sawyer grew. Jack yeah. and Locke. Yep. Well, you know, also, um, Sawyer's, Sawyer's completely in his element now. Yeah. Um, you know, when they're time traveling, he's, he has no control and is freaking out. But here, he's like, oh, I can con Horace, I can con Richard, I can con whoever. And he's right up, you know, he's in his element and he knows how to handle it. So, of course, well, he would he also, thrive in that situation. Well, he also tells Miles, he goes, yeah, I'm going to talk to him. He goes, what makes you think you can do that? And, and he goes... I did it for I do it for a living. Yeah, it's what I it's yeah. what I do, and and he also had but he also has the upper hand. Like with Richard, he has information. Mm -hmm. It's almost like Ben. That's what makes Ben so successful. Is ben has information. Ben knows everything about everybody. Like what we talked about in the first part of this episode, he didn't know that Locke knew about Eloise. And I think it was right. UK. He doesn't like to know. He doesn't like to not be in the know. And that's what probably set him off. But no, but Sawyer is just amazing in this episode he just he's always one step ahead and he, and he had a great line when he, was, when he had a great line when he was talking to richard and he goes uh, about how john Locke poofed just like he was ringing a bell <laughs> like, be good. i like that one yeah but he also it's a sawyer that we wouldn't have seen in season one or two when he sees when they see the well he right away is jumping to go say john Locke, and, and it's just it's like a you know there's mm -hmm. like two feet deep <laughs> I mean, the, the, the amazing thing about the Sawyer relationship to John Locke is that, and you hear about this from time to time, is that the con men become victims of cons themselves, right? Right. In the sense that, like, his his belief in John Locke is completely contradictory to everything else about his personality. Right. But the the one thing I'll say about the this whole growth of Sawyer that you mentioned is that if Sawyer was such a successful con man before the island, you know, he wouldn't have been in the situation that he was in, right? Okay. Right. So, I mean, you know, he had the skills, but he just wasn't at that level. And what you can see is in in the way that he saves his team and allows them to be part of Dharma Initiative is that he's mastered this art of persuasion and deception, right? Right. Which, it's such a contrast to John Locke's inability to persuade anyone to come, right? Right. <laughs> so, or or deceive anyone, right? <laughs> so that but, there is but, a real strong contrast between those two characters. And but they did the a end, great. Go, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, finish. Well, it's just like you can see, like you have to ask yourself. It's like at that point in time, would you rather be? Locke, or would you rather be Sawyer? And I think everyone answers Sawyer, right? Well, yeah. One hundred percent, I'd want to be uh, Sawyer there. Um, I you think have the nice hair and everything else. So. <laughs> I really liked how um, Juliet took care of Daniel when they first came back and found him sitting there, just yes. you know, scatterbrained with Charlotte having disappeared. Um, that was a nice scene. I, I wrote down that she's always saving slash helping people, continuing to do that. Um, and, but she also kind of causes a little bit of suspicion there when, um, you know, Sawyer's like, we've got to keep it cool. You know, we're going to follow Amy to the wherever she's leading us or whatever. And then, Dan, you know, Faraday's about to walk into the pylons and uh, Juliet's like, stop. And Amy's like, what and Juliet's like, I don't know. It looks like some sort of 
sonar yeah, weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should turn it off. <laughs> and I'm like, she knows exactly what that is. Uh, the same way she did that, I really like Richard's, like, uh, you know, this little breadcrumb to the audience of um, uh, uh, that thing might keep some things out, but it doesn't keep us out. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot a lot of good lines in this one. Um, I forgot what I was going to say, though. I was going to say something. Anyway, go ahead. Keep bring well, up something while, else. While, you know, they were all sitting outside, you know, when um, Sawyer was debating the terms of their how long they were going to stay their airbnb agreement if you will with horace <laughs> um you know they're all sitting outside and i love how the camera kind of moves around the table like it does and you know juliet's like that's my house i lived there for over three years and you can just right. see it that she's you know the wheels are turning and then here comes the little red-headed girl waving at faraday and god that's still one of the best scenes in the show. I think it's just so, especially after losing Charlotte and knowing. Right, it so quick, yeah. Respectfully, um, respectfully disagree. Oh, you don't like that scene? No, I don't. I this whole Charlotte thing is too fast. Have, do you never have a heart? I don't have a heart, and, and especially <laughs> especially when it comes to Charlotte, I think it just happened too fast, and it was too um, ham-fisted, if that's a term that you guys understand. Um, yeah, but they had they had to they had to get well. They're they, had to do something, they had to do something with Charlotte's character. Yeah, yeah. Well, the writer strike happened, and her backstory was not fully fleshed out in season four. So they right. did as best they could, and I feel I felt like they did a great job with. Well, she's going to die now, but over the course of the season, you're going to see her as like a three year old or whatever she is now, and then a six year old later when Faraday actually sees her eating the chocolate bar and you know, the tie in and all that. And I thought that that was a great way of doing it. But I just thought it was, it was like way too quick. It was like, he's still in this massive, massive uh, hole from her just being gone. And then all of a sudden, bam, there she is. That's um, awesome. uh, and I thought that, um, and looking at big picture now, it's like, I'm on this railroad to, uh, I guess it's whatever happened, happened with Eloise and all that business there. Um, whenever that if happened, this had been season two of Lost, they would have dragged that out for like six episodes, right? Yeah, but I think since, I mean, they had, since they were on pace to end the show, I think they just I think they rushed it a little bit too with Miles and 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 Hurley just jumping in and telling talking to Miles and and Pierre Chang, Chang. yeah. Well, um, you know, in season six, you know, the episode The Candidate after you know everything happens with the submarine, yeah, um, you know the next scene is Jen walking in the hospital with the flash sideways. So do you feel similar with that scene? Oh, I got opinions about the flash sideways. No, I mean, just that scene specifically, <laughs> but that scene specifically is exactly what you're referring to in the whole, you know, you're saying Faraday just lost Charlotte and then he suddenly sees her. Well, that kind of just happened in the sideways too. Um, yeah, but the sideways is, I, I don't count that as, like, I wouldn't count that as the same thing because I don't like it in general, the sideways. Um, oh, Lord, you have put me on here with a with a finale denier? What is up? No, did I say finale? Did I say <laughs> finale? I think I that I cried during the finale. I cried many times during the finale. The sideways, <laughs> sir, the sideways is half of season six. And, uh, you and, put and me I, on here with a conspiracy that, theorist. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very controversial because I, I try to make this show more like Springer. Um, uh, I, I just thought it was too fast, too much. In, in one scene, she her nose is bleeding, and in the next scene, you see her as three. And I thought it could be, I thought it could be a little bit more subtle. But I think what I thought the way it worked for me, and I, I, I hear what you're saying, but the way it worked for me was he just he wasn't even over it yet, and it's like boom, and, and it's that like, gave him that little bit of hope, which yeah. is like why you don't see him later because he's off trying to, you know, make things not happen, even though whatever right. happened happened. But he's like, you know, you see him perk up like, oh, there's a chance to still save her, you know that that I think I think it was necessary to show his immediate motivation and had that not happened so close to her death it may not have had as big of an impact as it did because the girl he loved died died you yeah. have made me understand more 
but you have not made me like it more. <laughs> oh, well, that's fine. <laughs> We're here to dissect. And yeah, yeah. I there was the last episode I was on, what I don't remember what it was, but somebody, it was you, Jack, you said something. And I was like, I've never heard that before. And I am completely blown away. And I have no clue how I've never heard that. Do you remember what it was? I mean, it like completely changed a character or a scene or a season I, or something. It, I don't know. I remember saying it, but I don't know what it was. Yeah. I'm so, 50. yeah, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> I did want to say, though, because uh, Juliet, Sawyer gets Juliet to do, you know, to deliver Amy's baby. because She's a mechanic, but she's really a doctor. And, of course, Juliet is nervous because every time she's tried to do this, the women have died. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I had something that I've been doing this rewatch. I had something a few weeks. I don't know what it was, but which episode it was, but I said, is, was Ben killing the women? Or that's what it was. Oh, was it? That's what okay, it was. It was. Was Ben killing the women to keep Juliet on the Island? Because Juliet couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And Ben doesn't care about people. So why would he kill the people? So why was Juliet able to deliver the baby? Cause she's capable. And she didn't have Ben there to kill Amy. So I don't know what she didn't have Ben there to. Uh, well, kill she, Amy. she was able to success, deliver the baby successfully because she, you know, because every every she says she goes every woman I've tried to deliver on this island has died, I, and she couldn't take it. She could tell. Remember, she would always be just a wreck after each, and you can understand why because she was brought there to save these women and the baby, and they they would just die. So. And I always thought, I, I never thought until I did this rewatch that Ben was behind the women dying because he loved Juliet and to keep Juliet on the island. She, I mean, he, I, said, he said, you can't leave until you figure out this problem. Yeah. So that was what like completely blew my mind. I still don't agree with that, but, um, or don't like believe that in my mind. Uh, but I think that that's like an awesome theory that I'd never heard before. But anyway, I did. I, I was thinking. I was like, "Wait, it's been three years. Has nobody else had a baby yet?" And then I realized that they said that it had been, or that they always deliver off island. So right. I was like, "Oh, well, that makes sense. She's having an emergency, you know, um, delivery now." Well, they don't have a. They don't have a doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, they I, said. Well, they said they usually give birth on off or off island. Right. Right, but then the doctor wasn't there, also. So then that's when you know Julia had stepped in or whatever. Yeah. Uh, David in the chat says, "Did that give Daniel the reason to build the lamp post?" Talking about Charlotte, probably. Talking about Charlotte, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Why? Why? Why do we think Daniel built the lamp post? To find the island, so to bring. Yeah, Charlotte. why do we think he's the one who actually did it? Did he ever say that he did it? I thought Eloise did. I yeah. thought he did it. I thought he had the. I thought he had the. The he drew the plans for it. Yeah, but Eloise would have had all that after he died, and huh. she would be trying to get everybody go to go back to the island and all that, and to try to make sense of his things. Um, that makes know. sense. Caleb's got me on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Where did he say he was at, though? Did he say he was in Ann Arbor? Who? Uh, the, the lamp post is in L.A. Correct. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, no, it is. It is. Yeah, it's in. I'm just. I'm just. Yeah. Joking. Well, I was thinking, you know, too, but I think that. Um, I wouldn't go there. All the traffic is too much. <laughs> uh, it takes forever to get to that Dharma station or whatever. Well, Ben wasn't lying there when he said when he was in the couple episodes of the, <laughs> in the van. All the traffic. I mean, at the time they're driving, there is no traffic, but I'm sure they were on the freeway at some point, And there's always traffic in LA. Go ahead. Like, this this is taking forever, and I'm holding this. I'm holding here at gunpoint. Like, when are we gonna get there? <laughs> traffic is bad. Uh, but anyway, then we have uh, we have the great scene. Between Sawyer, because we don't know that we don't know they're a couple yet. I, I all I wanted to say is when uh, when they're at the dock and he's trying to get because Juliet was going to leave. He goes, "Look, who am I? You know, who am I? That Miles guy's a jerk." And 
Jen, he's no conversationalist. I don't speak Korean, whatever it was. And now we, Jen, three years later, speaks great, you know, perfect English. Um, but he, he looks at, you know, you have my back. Just give me two weeks. And the way she looked at him, you're like, going, all right. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, you had the, you had the, I don't know, it was real water, fake water, whatever it was behind him. It was just a great moment. And then you have Sawyer walking through the thing because he's, and he picks the flower up and he walks in there and he goes, what's for dinner? And she Super now knows how to cook. Super 70 Sawyer. I love it. Yeah. And gives a flower. And as you can see, they kiss. She cuts and, yeah. cucumbers terribly for a salad. Well, yeah. she, 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 at least she didn't burn them. You can look at the bowl. It's not good. It's not good. I love how, I lo first of all, the dock scene is one of the best scenes in the whole show. Absolutely stunning. Every, the acting, from the, acting, the acting between uh, Josh yes. Holloway and Elizabeth Mitchell is perfect. The way she kind of like turns her head like, am I really going to do this for you? You know, like, am I really going to stay? Um, because, you know, he kind of talks her out of it because she's like, he says, well, whatever you're going back for hasn't, you know, doesn't exist yet. She's like, that's still not a reason not to go. And of, of anybody, of anybody, she would be the one that would not care. That like, it wouldn't she, matter. She just needs she's not, she's, to get off the island. Even though she was married before and she had, um, uh, not Ethan, uh, uh, what's his name? Good, good not good year. Goodwin. <laughs> good, good Goodwin. <laughs> Sorry. Goodwin. She didn't really truly love Goodwin. Goodwin was just someone to pass the time. Obviously, her first husband. She so she's probably never really truly been in love, right? And so the way the way she looks at Sawyer, even before we know that they have hooked up, she, you can tell she's she's got a thing. She's she kind of loves him. She kind of likes him. And the actor the the the, the uh, actor's uh, chemistry is like undeniable. It's it's yeah. that, it's that weird one where you can see it happening. Uh, very anti Gili kind of thing. Have you read the um, book by Pearson Moore? Um, I think it's called Identity, Lost Identity. Mm, no. Um, well, he goes through every character like of the show and kind of breaks it down. And um, it's a great book. And it's a great, you know, turn to just a, you know, a, a section and look at Richard Alpert's story or whatever. And under the Juliet section, he really, you know, you know, I got the book years ago, but um, he talks about her relationships and how like all these people had used her in one way or another. Right. How um, Edmund Burke could use her for her research and her talents and her smarts. And so he get ahead. Yeah. And how uh, Ben, obviously, we know yeah. that. And then um, Jack, how he was technically just using her to kind of get back at Kate. Right. And Kate would run off with Sawyer and all that. And so, like, she had all these people. And so, finally, with Sawyer, you had somebody who wanted her for her. And there was no underlying, you know, need there or whatever. And I think it's great that um, I just think the dog scene, you know, I mean, everybody knows when you say the dog scene what they're talking about. And I love the scene when he goes to pick the flower because you're like, Sawyer's picking flowers. What? Right. And it's it's because it's almost like Sawyer would never stop to smell the the roses. Or whatever, exactly. Like. Exactly. And he is stopping to smell the roses because he yeah. smells the flower and he's like going, hmm. Mm hmm. And I think um, I love the line when she when she says, you know, you know, he said, "You were amazing today," and she says, "Thank you for believing in me." Right. And it's like all she ever wanted was somebody to truly, you know, love her to believe in her. And thought it was just beautiful, beautiful. And this is this is the character stuff we love, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not in this episode. I hate to bring it up. I'm sorry, but it's in the next episode. I think. Like one of my all time scenes of the entire show is the scene with Sawyer and Jack, when uh, Sawyer is basically like, "I'm going to sit and read a book and figure out what to do next." Yeah. Go away. <sighs> basically. <laughs> and uh, you know. Uh, because you got people killed, right? People got killed. You, people died because you re you reacted to things. And I'm going to think I'm going to read a book, you know, even though they basically know the time there is over, no matter what they do. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I want to say, yeah, it's good. That is a good uh, scene. But that, I want to say, though, this is the first time Sawyer's really had true love. 
Yeah, right. I think she changes him more than he really changes her. Um, yeah. I loved her from the very beginning as a character. Um, without anybody, without a relationship, couldn't care less. Hated Sawyer from the very beginning. Did not like him until this episode when I finally was like, hmm. And then after what happens later on in the season, and he kind of resorts back to his, you know, mean self, um, could care less about him. But yeah, there's a span of episodes here where I like him. <laughs> <laughs> but then he's, um, he's talking, to, but he was talking to Horace as Horace is, you know, talking about, you know, how Amy's, you know, Paul and all that stuff. He goes, how do you get over someone in three years? He goes, and he's, and he's obviously talking about Kate. He goes, yeah, I, I was into someone and I can't even remember what they look like. You know, I just kind of, mm -hmm. And so what happens next? He's in bed with Juliet. He gets a call. And who does he see? Kate. Hugo. No, kidding. Hurley. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hurley, Jack, and Kate. But uh, you, see, you see him look at Kate like, because uh, Ethan sent uh, Eckhart and I both a uh, Twitter message <laughs> with that scene. And uh, yeah, it just, it's one of those scenes where it's like going, oh, don't go back to Kate. That was my that was my first thought. No, you're happy. Just Kate is just all over the place. Don't don't do it, Sawyer. Don't do it. I like to you know in the episode you know before the phone rings, just you know. Oh, that's it. There, there's something I want to <laughs> there's something I want to go back and point out. I know we're at the end, but I like to go back to that scene with Richard and Sawyer real quick. Sure. And just look at the camera work if you can for a second and they have this basically Sawyer point of view while he's talking to Richard, like right. very tight on Richard. Um, and it was crazy and amazing. I never really noticed it before, but it's his like eyes looking at Richard telling a story and Richard's like, and who are you? And I just, yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I That's thought it. that was, that was a, that was a great scene also because it's showing like how Sawyer was able to stump Richard, right? Right. Yeah. And we still, up to this point in time, we still think of Richard as like almost like some sort of a, you know, demigod. We're not sure what he is or who he is. He but, uh, and the fact that Sawyer is able to like outwit him. Yeah. Um, is amazing. And Richard's um, living in good times. These are the 70s. There's eyeliner everywhere. <laughs> Well, so, uh, Sawyer even says that. I'll go talk to him. The guy lighter. <laughs> guy lighter, yeah. yeah. That, that was a running joke in the Lost community. Is, a, is, this, is he wearing eyeliner? <laughs> yeah. Also, just, like um, the scene where, you know, after Juliet, you know, is able to help Amy successfully give birth, she comes out and just the smile on her face. Yeah. Like that, like. You ever seen a smile that big? You know, you can tell that like she finally did it three over three years. And Caleb, do you watch The Expanse? Huh? Do you watch The Expanse? Yes. <sighs> okay. All right. Oh my God. Let me tell you how much I, I love every single one of like Elizabeth Mitchell's characters. I mean, my God, season three was incredible. Um, love her character. God. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I'm in the middle of season two right now. How are you? Okay. Well, yeah. I, I haven't started it yet, so. Well, she'll be on. But she'll going on. back to that scene that Kayla was describing, I mean, what what was fantastic about that is she's smiling, but before she's smiling, as she comes out, you can see the tears in her eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it really like builds into like, and I couldn't, I could when I watched it, I couldn't remember what the outcome was, but like, you're really like positioned to assume like that she failed again, right? Right, and yeah. the fact that they're able to couple that pain with the relief um, of achievement was fantastic. Um, going back to Phil, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, he does not deserve about, this much attention. No, he does. He does because, I mean, he's he a pivotal character, data. right? Yeah. <laughs> but when when Richard enters the premise and they're all panicking, right? Phil is like the one that looks like he's going to s his pants, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's supposed to be part of the group that is. I mean, isn't he technically like some sort of like security detail? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's basically observe, observe, like he's like 
you know, well, he hides in the room and watches cameras. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, but he's like panicking. And as I was thinking about like how Horace told Sawyer that he wasn't like Dharma material. Right. Yeah. And at that moment I was like, how, how did that guy feel like make it into Dharma? Right. He must've been some sort of legacy or something. Right? <laughs> Cause he was totally ill-equipped for his, for his work. Uh, I would agree. And plus he's afraid of, he's afraid of Sawyer. Right. So yeah, I, I agree. I would agree with that. Uh, I love that. Actor. I've seen him a lot of things. He's in Mad Men. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the very first time I ever saw him was in that movie swimming with sharks. That Frank Whaley, Kevin Spacey movie from like the late nineties. Who did who does he play in Swimming with Shark? Is he one of the friends? He's literally like at the very beginning talking to Frank Whaley in a restaurant. That's like the first. Oh, that's time what I was saying. Like one of those guys that like are looking to Frank Whaley like for for networking leads and advice, right? They're looking up to Frank Whaley, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it's him and it's him and uh, Styles from Teen Wolf. They're the two guys. Oh yeah, uh, I did want to say about going back to the Juliet scene. That, you know, she's she's crying, she's beaming, but she's just is so, you know, happy. Now, part of Ben's leadership, you know, is to make people feel like crap, and people feel like you know that that they need him, and that they're they're not great achievers because you you see he's he's always playing mind games. So again, that goes to my point that he was probably killing to keep Juliet down because if she succeeded, it's like when when Locke comes back to the camp after. He says he killed Anthony Cooper, but he doesn't. People are looking at him like, "Oh my God, you're a you're a hero. You're you're this. You're that." Ben doesn't like it. Ben likes people to fail. He thought he was sending Locke off because he knew Locke wouldn't couldn't do it. Well, Locke didn't do it. Locke conned James into doing it or uh, Sawyer. So that's basically how Ben's approach to leadership is: is he wants to make everyone, you know, knock them down a notch so that he's considered the smartest guy in the room. Sounds like he'd be good at retail. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he would be. That's why he has all that money. But anyway, I I, I thought that I, I probably enjoyed this episode more than I enjoyed the first one, even though the first one, Life and uh, Death of Jeremy Bentham, is so good. I just I just I just love this episode. Caleb, the, ca Caleb, the the episodes that this man has given me and Eckhart to do, this is like this is such a breath of fresh air. <laughs> such good episodes. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, this is like, in, I think it has to be in my top 10 episodes for sure. Um, there's so many memorable right. scenes. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Do we think Charlotte, Jen taught Charlotte Korean during those three years while I, they lived? I, I think so. Yeah. I think so too. I like to choose to believe I like, that. I like to believe that. What do you, who do you guys think? Sounds good to me. I like it. Never heard it before. I like it. Sure. Now I have a follow-up question to that, though. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and again, I don't. I haven't watched all the episodes leading up to this, so I don't remember what Charlotte's demeanor was, though. Dead. It was dead. Why doesn't? Yeah. Why, why doesn't? Why doesn't Charlotte remember some of these people then? She was six, right? Yeah. She. I mean, she when. When she was, um, you know, flashing, uh, she told Daniel, she was like, I remember a man scaring me when I was little, and I think that man was you. Yeah, but and before that. So that's all she really knows. How would um, she remember Jen, Jen, Jen didn't speak English when she first, when, she, when she's on the, when she's on the island the second time, Right. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, so she arrives at the beginning of season four, right? Right. Okay. So she, season four through, then she dies in the middle of season five. During that time period, even before she starts flashing, like, when she actually meets some of the people, you know, you know, like Sawyer and, and um, Juliet, like, that there's no, like, association with the people that was on on the island when she was a child, right? Well, like I said, she's, you know, how many She's how many very young, young, you know, and she only saw them days, really. Um, and I think only the reason why she was able to remember Faraday is, one, I think he was kind of her constant, and two, it was because of her 
consciousness flashing in that moment. So how many, they overlapped three years, right? Yes. Right. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, if she was older, she would remember it because, because Widmore remembered Locke. Right. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, these are, these are interesting. Those are always these interesting dilemmas with time travel, but the, for whatever reason, the first time I watched this and going back to the last episode, when Whitmore made the comment about having met Locke when he was young, like right. I never really like thought about that much, but like, we really have to wonder like how that experience might've driven impacted all of Whitmore's decisions in life. Right. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned that, but did, we know Locke didn't remember Richard, right? Right when Richard came to see him when he was a very young boy, of course, yeah. Right, right. I think when you get age <laughs> ten or younger, yeah. it's going to be really iffy and really easy to be like, "Oh, they never <laughs> remember that." <laughs> because you know, obviously, Richard looks the same as he did in 1955 as he did in 2000 whatever he came on the show six or whatever it was um because he doesn't age but of course in faraday would look the same too mm -hmm. as juliet and everybody else i don't know it's just great question um so sawyer says three years is long enough to get over someone um also he knew kate for only a few months so let's go ahead and get that out of the way real quick um but I don't think three years is long enough to get over someone. Someone that you have been in a long relationship with. Um, at least a few years. Right. For, sure. for Sawyer and Kate to have their chemistry or whatever they had and hook up a couple times in the span of, you know, two or three months or a hundred days or whatever it was. Um, you know, that shouldn't have lasting effects three years down the line, I wouldn't think. I mean, obviously, everybody's different, but I feel like, you know, compared to a relationship that lasted three years, like Sawyer and Juliet, for instance, um, he would be heavily affected by that years, years later. Um, and especially if it's a relationship that's like five, ten years long, three years goes by, you're you know, most people are not going to get um, over that quickly. And well, I don't know who knows. Y'all may have like lost somebody and then married somebody really quickly. I don't know. And I'm not trying to judge. I'm just saying, I don't know. For me personally, I probably would not be that way. Well, especially with Amy, she lost Paul. It didn't, they didn't break up. He died. He got shot in front of her. Right. So um, that's even more tragic. I think what Sawyer was doing there was trying to keep Horace level-headed it because he yeah. needs Horace for for him to keep you know being able to go with doing what he's doing and because he didn't know what happens if if Horace goes well who takes over does he take over and all this different stuff so he needs Horace to be the leader that he can manipulate so he he's he's just conning Horace. by the he way this, you don't think it was genuine no I don't think, might, a little mix I don't think so <laughs> Yeah, what Sawyer I, said I, at the end regarding you know I had a thing for a girl once I, can't I think I think that was face. you don't think that I was think genuine? that was I think it's genuine but it's also setting up the in, the ending but I think what he was telling Horace is because you're saying how do you get over someone in three years like I said she was obviously in love with Paul mm -hmm. you know and she's you know probably just went with Horace maybe a you know rebound or whatever it was because uh, Paul died in a way that was like I said it wasn't like it you know. I you can't know, stand some, you anymore. Go ahead. Some people are serial monogamists and they have to be with someone. And if something happens or if someone dies, you know, very quickly, um, they That's can meet true. someone and be, you know, there. Uh, you know, I don't want to bring up any names. I'm not judging anyone. But, you know, M Michelle McNamara d passed away, you know, right away. And, you know, Patton Oswald was remarried within a year or something. It's happened, you know. Yeah. More examples of that in my family and stuff like that. That's just like a public one. I think, I think it's different for everybody's needs and the kind of kind of person they are. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. And I but think I, you did the way that. I think you did bring up a good point because, you know, like I said, Sawyer and Kate had known each other for just months and he knew she didn't die. Well, 
assumed, I guess. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't like a three year relationship with Juliet and then, you know, to die tragically or whatever. Um, right. It's a very different circumstances. Plus so. she, she went off with Jack too. So his mind's probably like, oh, well, she's with the, with the hot dog. And plus yeah. Kate could never make up her mind either. So it's like, <sighs> and Kate, now he, ha he has sucks. someone who Kate truly sucks. loves him. Kate sucks. Mm -hmm. Anyway, All right, Jack. I've coming. got a I've got a crackpot theory for you. Okay, uh, and it's it's been building from the moment I started watching this episode. One okay. thing they did really good with with uh, with this uh, Dharma Initiative uh, centric episode is to show kind of how they caught a period in time where society was a little bit more innocent, right? You could see just the first line that Phil says, what are you guys having in here? Hoot and nanny or something like that, right? And it just <laughs> yeah. feels easier, right? So the reason we, we've talked about how Sawyer has grown and like he's, he's, he's much, you know, he's got all these, he's much more confident. It's not, that might be part of it, but what it really is, is now he was plopped into a, a time and a society that is much more innocent and much more easier to manipulate. So it's not just that like he's grown; it's that like the game got a lot easier for him because it's much more easier. It's wow. very easy for him to like manipulate someone like Horace. Yeah, well, that's a good point. But he also, has, like yeah. Phil. but he also has less hate in him. Thanks yeah, for Juliet. Yeah, and and even Richard at this point in time, like seventies Richard, is a, <laughs> a lot easier to like get over. <laughs> Right. Than the guy that's that we meet in the 2000s, right? Yeah, great point. I got three words for you. Gray's Sports Almanac. <laughs> Anyone? Exactly. Anyone? All right. All right. <laughs> Back to the future. Yeah, that's a great. I, 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 yeah, we all, I think okay. we all got it. Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, I think Sawyer's thriving in the environment because it's one of being able to con people, you know? Yeah. And so he's able to do that. So he's thriving in the environment, but also, like you said, it's easier to do that. But I think that once the con works, he's able to just kind of sit back and enjoy everything with Juliet and, you know, whatever. Um, so that's why it's, it's kind of devastating when he sees, you know, and for her, I think more in the next episode too, when they see the people back, it's like, we had this good thing. We were living it up. No one had a stupid cell phone. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And, and, and this is they over. Believe us, they believe us now. They've accepted us now. They, oh, Juliet's trajectory from that phone call, to the next episode to the finale is just heartbreaking because she immediately, immediately sees the writing on the wall. Yeah. I mean, and she immediately like checks out mentally and is like, here, here we go. What, and, and it's so sad because we mentioned all of her relationships before and how badly she was treated. And it was like, here she was on, on, a, on a, I mean, yesterday was her first successful delivery of a baby. And, right. you know, she's on this super high and she's been with, you know, uh, Sawyer so long and finally found somebody to love who loves her back and believes in her and all this that it all comes crashing down and it's kind of like, you know, of course this would happen to me type of a feeling. Another reason Sawyer might be happy too, if I just thought about this is he wanted Kate to stay on the Island and live in new Otherton. Remember he goes, what's wrong with this? Why can't we just stay here? Why can't we just live, live here? And she chose to go back to Jack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, that's why he's probably happy. That's what he wanted. He wanted to build, have a relationship with someone and just live there. He didn't, he didn't want to go back to the, he didn't want to go back to the real world. And I think he would have been perfectly fine with staying. Well, I'll say that. Um, with Juliet, if everything had panned out, I, I don't know. Then you throw the whole man in black Jacob thing in there. Um, I was I was going to originally say that I thought that Sawyer would have stayed on the island with Juliet because at the end he leaves, which is more of he's just leaving to get away from the bad memories right. at that point. Yeah. So that's right. why he's leaving. Yeah. But if she was still there, they might have stayed. 
But then if they had come back to present day, she may have wanted to be like, well, let's just continue this all file and, and let me go see my sister. <laughs> right. You know, I think so, he would, I think he would have gone with her, but he, yeah. there, there have been some, well, you don't know. Cause everything, everything, everything he experienced off the Island was bad. True. True. But he I does mean, have a daughter. He does have a daughter, but he didn't want the daughter to know him. I don't, I don't think know. Cassidy was ever going to allow that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Any more thoughts on this episode? Any more crackpot theories, Eckhart? No. Any more hate, Ethan? Any more, I, uh, hate. I didn't have any hate. I love this episode. I love season <laughs> five. I love season five. <laughs> I'm like, just giving you heart. This just stuff, heart. Uh, you know. But I do want to talk about um, John Locke for the previous episode. And Terry O'Quinn had no like direction that he was a different person completely, right? If I recall correctly, um, no. Like, it's just his performance through it all is is great. It is is excellent. Nick. It's like, and everyone you know, and this especially this uh, Josh Holloway here. You know what I mean? You yeah. know, Elizabeth Mitchell is one of those first people you don't need to say is great all the time because she's just great all the time. But Josh Holloway just really just he really shines through here in these next couple episodes, and I I, I like watching it. That's all I want to say. And I I know with the uh, with Terry when playing uh, non John Locke, as I I can remember it on the podcast saying, "Where was this Locke the whole time? He's this guy is competent. He's he's competent. He's." <laughs> And then when we found, I go, how did I not figure out that wasn't John Locke? Hmm. I don't really know how you didn't do it either, Jack Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I just kept saying, oh. and Jay was like, I see this, 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 he was this way the whole time. And I go, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's all I got. That's all I got. Anything, any, anything else you guys want to add about no, anything? Yeah. I think Julia, we took this coil like three, four times. <laughs> Jack, are we still doing the leftovers in the fall? Yeah. Uh, uh, whenever you want to do it, we'll be there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as soon as the loss is over. Oh my god, I would love to be a part of that. We need to shoot it for October fourteenth. Is that <gasps> when it started? The part uh, day. Uh, what are we at right now? Uh, We're at eight thirty. <laughs> what? We're at eight thirty. Uh, yes. Probably not gonna happen. You have my all of September dead. plus a couple of weeks. I, I don't know if that's going to happen. October. Well, well I'll, you know what? I'll I'll see what I'm doing, and then we'll go from there. Okay. All right. <laughs> but yeah, Caleb, if you want to join us, I, I, I oh, I would love it. Love yeah. the leftovers. If you want to hear me complain about how boring the first season, I'm not kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all right. So be on the lookout for the leftovers sometime this fall. This fall. Would you ever do Six Feet Under? I watched the first season of Six Feet Under. It's, and then for some reason, I, I just I fell behind and stopped. For me, it goes Lost, Six Feet Under, Leftovers, my top three. I do Deadwood. <laughs> I Dead haven't seen that. Keep your eyes about in Deadwood. Things happen. They're really fun to watch happen. There's not much to dissect in Deadwood. Well, why is there always... Jack, why, Jack why, spent five why, minutes dissecting the intro. <laughs> yeah, why is there poop? And outside... <laughs> The Gem Saloon, and I finally figured out why. Why I finally figured out why there's there's crap outside the Gem Saloon at the end of the credits. Why all the crap happens in the Gem Saloon? That's where they always talk about all the crap. That was the that's the hidden meaning. But because I go, why would they show poop floating outside? Because you have the the poop, the horse, you know, finishes its run, and then you see the Gem Saloon in the water, which is probably got to be pee because there's it never rains in Deadwood. There was not one rain scene in the entire episode of Deadwood. So, and you got poop. You got poop floating there. I went, oh, that's what it is. It's it's because all the crap is either talked about or happens in the gem saloon. Is anyone watching Lovecraft Country? Not yet. No, I haven't started it yet. I need it's, to get on it though. It's pretty. It's pretty. Pretty dang entertaining. I have to say. Is it? Yeah. What about Fringe? Good. Huh? Fringe? What about it? I did, my, I did my I did. I did on. <laughs> what? Charlotte's in that too. Hey. Yeah. If I could skip season four, I'd probably think about doing it. 
Oh. I was I that kept thinking about it. Yeah. I, I kept thinking about Jack talking about the way that um that uh Lance Reddick would always say liaison <laughs> at the <laughs> first few episodes of season one. I thought about that in the first episode tonight. Is Lance Reddick in it? Is he in fringe? Yeah, he's, he's one of the main uh, characters. Yeah, had... He's one of the main guys, yeah. Hey guys, yeah, guess what? Newsflash, haven't seen fringe. Cool. Oh. What? Cool, cool. cool. Well, it, oh, you should. I'll, I'll tell you this. Season one is a mess. Yeah. And then in season two, they finally figure out what they're going to do. Season two and three are excellent. Season four, I think they thought they were going to get canceled. They didn't know. I mean, it's like, what are we doing here? Season five is outstanding. So it's like, eh, one. Because I, I stopped watching when I first, because I, I was so bored and confused in the first season. I said, what are we doing here? This no. is just. I thought, oh, I, thought I think it's great. Fantastic. It's fantastic. Well, yeah. None of these problems. Yeah, I, mean, I it's, didn't like see. It's, it's one of those things where, um, I mean, if Caleb, you'll probably agree with me on this, that when you think about it now, um, there are a few things that could have been tighter, but it's only because we've seen a bunch of other shows since then. But for when the, the moment in time when it was done, it was really out there. And um, it's mm -hmm. not just um, not just the scientific, science fiction parts but the acting of walter bishop oh, is some yeah, of the best amazing. acting there is and the way that they tied in the whole th theme of the white rose um, yeah yeah well don't spoil being, it i'm never gonna yeah. watch it but don't spoil it um well the, the part who played what's in it after the he was in the mighty duck what's his name leonard namor oh, no, no, no no you're talking about joshua jackson who plays Peter joshua Bishop. jackson he used to yeah. skate at our rink Oh, yeah, because yeah, he, he was filming. Um, I didn't Creed. watch it. Hey Dawson guys, Creed. guys, yeah, Pacey. Is cool. Yeah, Pacey. Huh? Pacey. Hey, whatever it is, I didn't watch it, but he used to skate at a rink. So yeah, I guess the thing with Fringe is that, like you were, you know, talking about the first season. It, I mean, it does. I feel like it starts out as a procedural, uh, like yeah. a procedural, um, in terms of like supernatural like mm -hmm. case of the week type thing, right. like but then it develops the mythology of it just, just okay. shoots well, off. Got, Any way to watch that season and go ahead and get to the good stuff, or do I have to watch the first season? No, you want to watch everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, just bear in mind that like the first season is kind of like, oh, supernatural mystery of the week, but it all yeah, kind of yeah. comes back and ties and mythology. And but I mean, Lost they was, already like They already plant all the seeds. Like yeah. already in like episode two and three, I mean there are things that are relevant to the overarching so storyline. Because I tried to watch Person of Interest again, I really did because it's got that's good. For the first three se until well, I, won't I haven't spoil seen you. that. I just cannot do like, first three seasons are re are and... really good, but then they lose a, a character. But, well, <laughs> they, they want off the show, and when that character leaves, the show goes downhill. Well, yeah, but because you got Jonathan Nolan. And and you know Ben Linus of course and so I thought I'd give it another shot and after the second or third episode I was like okay here we are again doing the thing I can't do it so the only, the only problem is the machine only saves people in New York that's the only problem <laughs> so Caleb have you seen Dark no it's like on, it's next on our list we have binged okay. it's always sunny in Philadelphia right now. <laughs> And we're all like the about to finish. On that one is excellent. The what? Dunkle, Dunkle the you're talking about, Eckhart? Was yeah. that Dunkle? Yeah, that's Dunkle, yeah. Yeah, I totally, um, totally thought you were talking about that. Did y'all watch that show? Yeah, so, so it's dark. Always I, I, thought it was just, I thought it was just dark. I love Sunday. <laughs> yeah. But no, oh, Caleb, Germany. dark, dark um, has a lot in common with French. Really? Okay. I've yeah. heard a lot. And of would, Karen was talking a lot about that. And I would say that it's like an um, even more intense version of Fringe. Wow. Okay. It's the first season of Dark is really good. Okay. All seasons of Dark are really good. <laughs> well, I'm just saying because Fringe the first. I, I'll, I'll be honest, when I did when we because we did it for a podcast, yeah. and the, when I when I rewatched it, I said, you know what? When I got to like it was like the 11th or 12th or 13th episode of Fringe, I go. All right, now I'm into it. It may yeah. took that long for me because I watched the first two or three episodes and I just started going, God, this is just. I, I think I was the work. same way because I watched it kind of shortly after Lost and I was so used to not the mystery of the, you know, 
uh, week or whatever with every episode. And I was like, God, you know, by episode four, I'm like, this is just another like CSI. Like we're just finding a crazy it's except it's supernatural. Right. And then I like stuck with it and then was so happy that I did. Yeah. I'm glad I went back and I didn't like season four though. I thought season four was kind of boring. Oh, I'm gonna check season, it out. I'm gonna check out for but season five was I, I I think season five was her best season. And if you if you want something very very existential, um, makes you think so much about death, your legacy, what it means to be human, then I would strongly recommend Six Feet Under. I mean, just <laughs> absolutely, it's a drama, but it is it's beautiful. It is so beautiful. And my last name is Fisher, so <laughs> very helpful. Uh, in, in yeah. Fisher. You have to see it now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've seen it twice, tw two or three times. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I like it. I'm a big fan of uh, the person's name I don't remember, Claire. Mm -hmm. I love her. Yeah. I loved Brenda. A lot, she gets on people's nerves a lot in the beginning, but God, amazing! They're all amazing characters, just so well written, so well done. Um, but yeah, I would recommend that. And, and Dexter's and in there. Michael What's T. His? Hall, yes, he's yeah. great, great. I guess my favorite scene of all in Six Feet Under is always when uh, after Hiram and uh, Ruth marry. I guess is it Hiram and mm -hmm. uh, no, a George. George, which one? George is uh, George Sibley. But which guy? He's, he's uh, um, he Russian guy, or is he? He's, he's the one. Do you watch American Horror Story? No. Um, I watched first two, two or three seasons of that. Okay, you know season two. Uh, he's the old guy. As uh, you know, Asylum. He's the older man. Okay. He, he calls. Um, he call. He says, "You, Hoa." Instead of saying whore, he's like, you, you're just a whore. And it's just so funny the way he says it. But um, he's like this really famous actor. I well, after, 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 he get, well, after Ruth gets married and she sees uh, her, her ex, Richard Jenkins, in the corner crying in the kitchen. Yes. That's, that's the scene that gets me the most in that show. Yeah. Oh, it's only been three so, years. And, and what it does, and a lot of people don't realize this, it's so great about um hey, Mac yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, jack if you've not seen six feet under if you have it's all the first, first season okay and eckhart if you have you seen six feet under you're on mute i haven't okay so anyway you know how um you're in a grocery store or something and you overhear somebody being an ass or something and you, mm -hmm. you picture to yourself like i'd love to just grab them by the throat and you know throw them on the ground or, or something like that or i'd love to just pick up this watermelon and hit them with you know the show it like it shows characters doing that mm -hmm. and then it'll and then it will like you'll you'll be like oh my god what are they doing and then it'll cut to them just staring back Nice. Like imagining that yeah. and it does it so well because we as and I didn't I, I honestly it was kind of like a wake-up call for me but I honestly did not realize everybody does that everybody yeah. has like comes up with these thoughts and imaginary I do, things I, do it, I did it today when I was at the Wegmans <laughs> yeah I mean everybody like has these th you know imaginary things like um, you know what if uh, you know somebody stormed in my door right now or whatever and and then then it cuts back like oh that that's just a that's a projection that's a worry of the character that's something that's a want of the character this character is wanting to lash out in some way this is a right. um something the character is afraid of it, it it says so much about the characters when you do it that way and it, it does such a good job of portraying that and i've never seen that done before in any other show <laughs> it's just fantastic well scrubs and and more to the point, I know the name of the trance song that's playing in the gay club when David is doing drugs for the first time. It's Bullet in the Gun by Planet Perfecto. I have Shazammed so many songs from that show. It's ridiculous. It's great. I have the soundtracks from the I'm show. Here, I'm human Shazam. My name's Ethan. I was going to say, the only good thing, because you're talking about, you know, uh, the only thing good about the pandemic is I'm wearing a mask. 
and like today at Wedding is they probably didn't see me utter or my my mouth went like I want to kill you because you won't move. I want you need to get out of my way. You know, it's this whole thing I'm thinking about, but I was mouthing it because they can't read my lips. And I'm just like going, why are you in the middle of the aisle? You know what the worst thing about the pandemic is? I still can't hang out with Eckhart, even though we don't live that very far from each other. <laughs> Where do y'all live? Or do you want to say that when this thing is over? I no, we know it's in Maryland. I live in Maryland. So, oh, okay. yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Someday, hey, hey, someday. Hey, hey, if anyone cares about The Who, I'm doing a show on my own YouTube channel. It's Who? The, it's called The Fisher Protocol, um, named after a part of The Leftovers. Which leads me on another tangent. I wanted to talk about the name Jeremy Bentham, but I'll do that later in the fall. Um, but I've decided just to keep it about the Who right now because that's what mm -hmm. I know. Um, we've already done Quadrophenia. We're doing Endless Wire, and then we'll go on to Tommy and all that kind of stuff afterwards. The Fisher Protocol sounds so familiar. It's from the it's from the Leftovers mm -hmm. uh, in season three, and mm -hmm. the most the, man mm -hmm. and his identical twin brother. You know what I'm talking about. Yep. I've also made a Lego it, of that scene. I can show that to you later. <laughs> well, you should do that because I'm trying to get my, you know, my grandson, Zach, is six and he's a, like a Lego master. Somehow I stumbled. Oh, I, was, I was stumbling. Uh, somehow my YouTube, uh, my thing just kept going. I was watching something. I had to get up. I had, I've had grandkids all week last week. For six straight days, we had grandkids. <sighs> and so my mind's kind of mush. But anyway, I... I was watching something. I had to get up like an hour later. I come back and I go, the hell am I watching? It, just, it was a guy building little things out of Legos, like a safe and this. I'm like going, well, I could do that. And I'm looking, I go, there are 3,400 people watching this live and commenting in this section. Building. Wow. He's, all he's doing is like putting Legos together. I go, what is going on here? <laughs> I said, 3,400 people watching this guy put together Legos and they puts that away. Then he builds something. I said, Zach, that's your channel. That's what you should be doing. You're a Lego master. He's you looking probably get, the, probably get the views too. Speaking of YouTube, I just want to say over here right now publicly, Hey, Eckhart, sorry for the chats during the ramble cast, buddy. I don't know if you read those. I'm just kidding. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> did you leave, did you leave Facebook too? Uh, Cause uh, you've left, right, Caleb? Yeah. Pretty, basically. Right? Yeah. 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 Have speaking of uh, the leftovers, um, do, do you? <laughs> well, Caleb's going to fit right in. Uh, favorite, 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 favorite sentence in the entire world. Speaking of the leftovers, let's go. I just need to know: Do you think Nora told the truth? No, 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 no. That's no, 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 no we're, that's end game stuff. We're not talking about that now. Oh, but I need to know so badly. <laughs> Look what I have! <gasps> oh, oh that's so awesome. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! Did you pay a lot for it? Because I remember searching on eBay and I was like, "God, these are outrageous! I cannot find them." I, think I don't like, know what they're I going for now. Bucks. It's not, it wasn't much. I burned the awesome. original at a bonfire at the beach one time. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when my, da my dad moved into his house. He, uh, the person left. This, there was this giant bookcase in, in end of his hall. Wall to wall with National Geographics. I said, "Why don't wow. they take these?" And he goes, "I don't know." And he left them there for the longest time. But I think eventually someone came and got them, or something like that. Or anyway, oh, we that. we did not mention um, in the life and death of Jeremy Bentham, um, Caesar was going through the drawers, and there was a Life magazine from 1954, and it was talking about um, a hydrogen bomb, or it had a bomb on the front of it, right? Um, so speaking there was of also old notes magazines, in there too, right? There was notes he found in there. Yeah. What about yeah, the and some, some of Rousseau's drawings and maps. Yeah. From uh, we still have one person left in the chat yeah, after almost two hours. Yeah. I don't think I've done one of these that's not went two hours. Because <laughs> there's <laughs> always a, at least a 30, 40 minute devoted to Juliet. For yeah. sure. Wait, Every wait, time. We we'll get to the leftovers. Yeah. Oh, I'll After love watching it. this I'll series, Game of Thrones, I love Lost more and more. And thanks for the rewatch, guys. So there you go. Looked. So 
I'm really petty. I never watched Game of Thrones after George R. R. Martin made that comment about the Lost finale. I was like, screw you, I'm not watching your stupid show. So I didn't. And then I heard all these terrible things about the finale, and I'm like, ha, huh, now I'm definitely not watching it. <laughs> I'm I mean, it may love it, but it's okay. <laughs> All right. Game of uh, Thrones, there's no per sorry. Last thing, like Game of Thrones, there's no perfect show. You can give a list of episodes to people too. I, to I have, I have two grandkids at six thirty tomorrow. But go ahead, keep talking. Did I hit a nerve? I'm sorry. Game of Thrones. <laughs> I I liked. I I I had no problem with Game of the ending wasn't great, but I had no problem. I'm glad I watched it. That's fine. What about you, Ethan? I'm done speaking. Have a good night. <laughs> go ahead, finish your thoughts. I don't have any thoughts. You have. Grandkids at six thirty. No, at, at this point, what does it matter? I, I don't know. I no. I was just gonna say it's a show that you can give people like a couple episodes of each season to say, "Here's the spectacle. It was great. Here's the budget. It was fun." But you don't need to watch this whole thing. So you don't think you had? Thrones. You didn't like it. It wasn't my. It was. It's not a. Re, it didn't have rewatch uh, value for me. I've seen the leftovers, and I'm I'm watching ER again for like the 80th time right now. <laughs> I've seen the leftovers 48 times or something stupid. So, now do you like do you like ER? I mean, I know we've talked about this. Do you like ER all the way to the end, or is it like okay, it's season 11, we need to wrap this up? I don't like watching them as the same show. I like them watch watching them as different shows, if that makes sense. Because they're different characters. I like watching like a chunk of like season like a season 11 to 15 as a chunk. Or later, I'll watch seasons one through five. It, it's a different show. Eckhart yeah. just said, "Screw it, I'm out of here." Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> he uh, he time traveled. Yeah, I just want to say this: every time Jack turns off the thing, we say good night. We're always here, and we always say a cordial good night. Eckhart is always just gone. Oh no! Yeah. Oh, is he coming back, or is he is he done? I think he's probably done. Okay, he's, he's probably got six grandkids in the morning. Who knows? Hey, grandkids are great. Uh, um, I, don't, I know I said this last time, and I, you said you were going to write it down. I just want to verify that you did uh, and write my name down for the incident. The incident? That's the finale, right? Yes. Okay. okay. I want my name written down. If you're doing, if you're going to have, if you're going to bless me and have me on again, I would love to do whatever episode that's mainly focuses on Jack and his fake child. So you the lie house. Six. The season lighthouse. six episode five. Oh, the more of season five. I know you got a lot of people. Um, if it's the lighthouse, it's the lighthouse because his fake child likes the who. Well, just, just remind me because actually I threw away. I, I knew you wanted the incident because Juliet, and that's why when I was doing this, I was and I and I had this uh, and I went. Oh wait a minute! I'm, I'm sure Kayla would want to do this episode with uh, Lafleur. That's why I said late. And I just was. Been, I said it's. Caleb, are you I, available to do a Gia podcast with me? Am I what? Available to do a Gia podcast with me? A what podcast? Gia. Gia, the Angelina Jolie movie. Oh, the movie. Oh, oh for sure. Yeah. Just no clothes on that. For sure. With no clothes on, so I could watch that. She's also an ER. Yeah. She is an ER. That's right. Mm -hmm. I never and, saw uh, her and Carrie together. I'm sorry. The Purge. Uh, I would do one on The Expanse, which is maybe it's going to be hard since... Cass and all that. All right, here, wait, wait one second. Wait, hold this thought. thought. All right, guys, thanks for joining yeah. us. We're out of here. Thanks, Eckhart. <laughs>